Hey, welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. Brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is an interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at FunkinStuff.net and on YouTube. Truth and Rhythm can also be enjoyed on the go in its audio podcast edition from iTunes and other lead podcast providers. I'm your host, Scott Dr. G.S. Goldfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One that First Got a Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. It's chock full of funk delights and goodness, and um, you just can't go wrong with it. So if you're a fan, it's a must-have. If you already have a copy, great gift. Friends, family, spread it around. This episode features songwriter, singer, arranger, and producer Sidney Barnes, who has been active in music since the early 1960s, as a staff writer from Motown, member of the Rotary Connection, and working with George Clinton, the Jackson Five, the Supremes, Denise Williams, Mindy Repertine, B.B. King, and many others. According to Wikipedia, he has appeared on more than 150 albums. Barnes is also famous for spotting, encouraging, and mentoring young talent, including Donny Hathaway, Maurice White, and Shaka Khan. He also recorded on his own, and when starting out as a member, of the doo -wop group, The Serenaders. Barnes' writing credits include Come See Me by Pretty Things, I Bet You by Funkadelic and the Jackson Five, I Can't Shake It Loose by The Supremes, Long Live Our Love by The Shangri-Las, and Watch Yourself by B.B. King. His career was rejuvenated in the late 1990s when his 1960s works were embraced by fans in England as part of the Northern Soul boom. In 2006, he released a 600-page autobiography called Standing on Solid Ground. In this in-depth interview, Barnes serves up a Forrest Gump-like account of his encounters with all manner of music industry stars and figures from the 20th century. Highlights include his stints at Motown and Chess Records, lifelong associations with George Clinton, being a core member of Rotary Connection, counseling Maurice White, and hanging out with Janis Joplin. Plus, he's got new music to share. So here's 60 years of rock and soul history from the mind of a man who was there for much of it, Mr. Sidney Barnes. And I'm pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Studios renowned singer-composer Sidney Barnes, who spent more than a half century in the music business and is best known for his work as a staff writer at Motown, with Rotary Connection, and through collaborations with Parliament Funkadelic, Denise Williams, Minnie Riperton, and many others. Sydney, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm doing fine, Scott. It's just a good day in uh, North Carolina for me. Yeah, I can dig it. I'm in North Carolina, too, so good to make that interstate connection. Yeah, man. <laughs> so, what's up? Hey, so, um, ready to uh, talk about some of your great history? If I can remember any of it, you know, some, with, uh, <laughs> with all the sex, drugs, and, and rock and roll, you know, some of it's kind of blurry. But when I was writing my autobiography, funny thing, I had to call a lot of other people to find out what I did, you know. <laughs> you you got to trust them. And they told me, yeah, they told me, you know. <laughs> you you got to trust them, too, then. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, because well, I had met most of them were people overseas, and uh, they're you know they're diehard uh, music fans, you know, especially the, the you know my generation and the kind of music I was doing. I mean, they knew first time I went over there, it scared the heck out of me because they knew everything I'd done, with, everybody I'd done it with. They knew the color of the labels, they know who played on the sessions. I mean, this was hundreds of people, you know. And uh, it really shocked me, and I was really pleased because I had thought about at that time when I went over 2001 that nobody, that people had forgotten what I said. That I told my wife one time, I said, you know, I cut a record in 1960, and I bet nobody in the world remembers it or knows it. I got it even a copy of it. But I went over there, and they said, oh, your record did well in Sweden, and uh, we know it, you know, <laughs> they knew the words and everything. So that opened my eyes, and ever since then, the wife and I have been going over there for um, every year, you know, doing concerts and things since 2001. Well, that's something else. So where, where, where did it all start for you, though? Where, did, where were you born, and uh, how did you first get into music? 
I was born in West Virginia, uh, Welfare, Virginia, a little poor, poor ass coal, coal mine. My daddy worked in the coal mine. He did everything he could to feed his little family. I was the only child. My mother was the sweetest thing you'd ever want to meet. She's very well educated and, and talented. And, uh, so she knew when she, you know, I was a frail little, little guy. So she, she was always glad to see me want, in, taking an interest in something. Um, so, well, yeah, I used to listen to her sing in church, and it was such a beautiful voice. And I realized that I could do it too. And then I discovered the radio, or should I say, the radio discovered me. And uh, then I started hearing music like bluegrass, and because I'm from the hills of, of Virginia, you know, so I played bluegrass and, and back home country music, you know. So I really got involved. I really got into bluegrass harmony, and I loved harmony. So when I realized I wanted to get into more music, my family moved around so that I could get closer to what was going on. We finally moved to D.C., and uh, I was able to hang around at Howard Theater, and which was part of the chilling circuit at that time. So um, and I started putting together doo-wop groups and. Uh, in high school, because my mother was the kind of woman, because she sang so well and knew music and could play piano, she would, she would, uh, they would hire her to, to, uh, uh, to put the junior choir together at church or, uh, or help with the, you know, school choirs. So I was always in her little choirs. And then a doo-wop came along and, you know, the heartbeats and, uh, and flamingos and all those people and, uh, I fell in love with doo up and uh, so I started, I had to rec- recruit people that sang that I thought they sang well, and I had to recruit them into my group because they weren't too active at the time. And one of them was her Beemster from Peaches and Her. He and I were in high school together. Beautiful voice. Then I discovered Marvin Gaye. He was he lived in another part of town, but I met him and he sang. And I had him in my group for a while. Uh, uh, Van McCoy, people like that, you know. Um, so went from one group to another and uh, trying to get a break. At that time, it was the late 60s, so I didn't know that thing as a record company, you know, I tell. So my friend, I met Bobby Darren and, and a lot of other people that used to hang around the Howard Theater when, you know, being part of the chilling sector, all of the great black entertainers came through and some of the white entertainers. And uh, that's when I met Bobby Darren because when Bobby joined the tour in New York, everybody on the road thought he was a black guy, you know, thinking Splish Flash. But he went over well, and it was great training for him. You know, he and I used to talk about that. But anyway, he said, man, if you want to make it, you got to move to New York. So then I met little Anthony and Imperials, and they said, man, if you want to make it, you got to move to New York. So we moved to New York. And that's when it really, really started. My daddy got a job, and we moved to New Jersey, actually. My daddy said, I'm not moving to New York. I'll get you close to New York, and then I'll have to get over there every day and get involved. So he paid my way over by, you know, every day. and did put the bus over there. Well, you know it, uh, I had another little little group together called the Serenaders with a fellow named George Kerr out of New Jersey. And uh, we would write songs around town and, and do a lot, a lot of background for different singers. And then I heard the Motown was coming to town. I arranged uh, an audition for Motown, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> wow, it's quite a, a history already. So, Sid, did Marvin Gaye uh, seem like he had something special when you first met him? I was... I was trained, like I said, my mother, I was trained by my mother. She, I watched her choose kids and why they, she chose them. And I began to realize that I could choose two. I could, I could notice certain things and certain kids. I mean, that's why I chose him. Because when I heard him saying, I knew he was different. I knew he was good. I didn't really realize the potential. I just knew at that time I needed a good second tenant. And he was a good second tenant. And uh, so I approached him, and his group was breaking up. So he, you know, heard my group, and he said, yeah, I'll sing with you. So uh, I, I always was able to recognize, even now, you know, in fact, my basic, my career was based a lot on recognizing the talent of others and working with them and and encouraging them, you know, because I always, I always called myself a validator. 
you know, because I was always the guy in the crowd that was a little ahead of everybody else that was trying to get somewhere. And I was always doing something that they wanted to be doing. So when they realized that I accepted them, liked them, and appreciated what they were doing, then they went on to bigger, greater things. Shaka Khan, Maurice White, Judge Clinton, you know, Donny Hathaway, all those people. So I, 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 that's what I like doing. You know, I like hearing somebody that's got something. Because, see, I was always a little different. And it was hard for me to get going in the business anyway because I was black. At that time, it wasn't as open to, to blacks as it is now. And nothing was. And um, I was always a little different. So as I grew and my talent grew and my opportunities grew, I looked for other kids that were a little different. You know, people, the kids that people would say, oh, you, you know, you think too loud or you dress too funny or you da-da-da. If they had talent, I saw it and I helped them. And, uh, you know, it paid off in, in a lot of ways. And, and how did you develop or try to hone in on your own singing style? Well, I, I I never understood. I used to when I grew growing up, like I said, I listened to. Um, I started off with bluegrass, then I started off with country guys like Little Jimmy Dickens and Earl Price and all those guys. Then I started like, hearing the Nat King Coles and the Mel Torme's and, and the Sammy Davis Juniors, and I realized that I could do what they were doing in the style that they were doing because I loved it. I just, it became it became me. And uh, so I'm, I'm music, you know. I can do anybody's music. I can copy anybody. And uh, so I start. And say I'm cook. I mean, so I started developing. I didn't start developing. I just started doing it more because I didn't know nothing about developing or where I was going to go, how good I was going to get. But I know one thing: that if you love something this much and you do it enough. You're going to either get good at it or you're going to find out that you got no business doing it. And the more I did it, the more people said, oh, yeah, come on over here and do that with us, you know. So every door, every chance I got to do something, people always let me in and teach me and take me under their wing. And, you know, so I, I developed that doing. And when I was in New York, I did background sessions. I just hung around people in their rehearsal, and I rehearsed with them, and, you know, sang different parts, and so it developed, you know, you develop by doing, you know, and I always, and I was always doing it, because this was all I ever wanted to do, and it's, you know, it was a, it was a mad obsession, and I didn't know why. I know why now, you know, but I didn't then. Did, did you get more fulfillment from uh, performing or from being in the studio? I got more fulfillment just by being in the being around the people that were doing it and in the business. When I was in, in school, I was always a little like I said, I was different because I drew. I was it was I drew, I draw and I sang and I was good with the girls, you know. So I had this horrible obsession about being around other people. I wanted to be around a mess of people that were like me. Different like me, you know, and, and they weren't, they weren't ever just everywhere, you know, they'd be saying like, so when I was in, got into music, I was totally around people like me. So I loved doing everything that included that, you know, it being sitting in a studio for two days, uh, working, uh, uh, sitting by a piano, working on stage, working, rehearsing. One of the guys, uh, it's like Herb told me, uh, uh, the features of Herb guy, he, he, we were kids. He said, man, you're gonna rehearse us to death. You know, we got no voice left. But I said, you know, I learned from my mama, practice makes perfect. And we all got good at it, you know, because they realized that I was serious and if I was going to put the time in, they would too. And uh so, you know, I just got, I got into everything. I loved watching other talent develop and grow. I love to hear somebody and say, wow, you got something. And they go, well, nobody else likes it. And I go, well, I like it. You know? And uh, so I did it with some people that became very big because, you know, I found out that that's why a lot of people didn't give me a break at certain times because they didn't know how to classify me. So, you know, but you don't classify talent. You just have to develop, and it finds its own classification. Yeah, yeah. Um so what was the series of events that got you into the doors of Motown? Um, 
At the time, I was with a family. We were living in New Jersey with my, when I was living in New Jersey with Newark with my family and coming to New York every day. And as fellow George Kerr and I had put together a group called the Serenaders because I realized I wasn't, I wasn't a solo artist. I didn't have it. Took. So I love doo-wop. I love harmony, man. I mean, I lived and died by harmony. So um, I re- we, we ran the group and put it together. And every day I would go over to New York to hang out at a place called the Brill Building. And uh, you'd, at Bear, it was the best way you'd meet all the people that were doing sessions and writing. And, and the business was completely different than it, than it ended up being in the 60s. But... Uh, 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 we, 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 I mean, they end up being in the 70s and 80s. But, uh, anyway, I was, I wanted to be with everybody I could, so by that time I'd been working around some pretty heavy pros, you know, doing background sessions and shit, and writing songs. I'd learned how to write songs. There's things I didn't know how to do. A lot of the people that hung around with me taught me how to do these things. So, you know, that's what it's like. You know, if you're in the music, there's really no school you could go to then. You know, we had to teach each other and encourage each other. So I was always looking for people to be with. Well, with Motown, we had a thing called the New York Sound, you know, and uh, we were all kind of proud of that. But when, but when, when um, Motown started putting out records by Mary Wells and, and Smokey Robinson, I mean, that just knocked everybody for a loop. And I said to myself, I said, I got to be with this label. Uh, but it plus was run by a black guy, and that was just about unheard of at that time. You know, and they were all really cool artists with uh, really cool names, and the sound was different. You know, and, the, and Benny Benjamin on drums, and, and the bass player was you know it was all new and it was all great. So I said, but I can't, I can't, I'm not going to move to Detroit. You know, we had enough time getting to New York, so I don't know what to do. I got to get with this label. All of a sudden, I read in the Cashbox magazine, which was a music magazine at the time, that Joe Bent Music was part, which was part of Motown the Records, was opening up a New York office. <laughs> well, well, duh, you know. So, right away, I was like the first guy in it. I was in the door. When they moved, I found out what time they were moving in, what office they were moving in. And I was there. I was getting in the way of the guys moving the furniture in. That's how I knew I was there. You know, so, I and this lovely little lady came up to me, and she was smiling. She said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, my name is Sidney Barnes, and I live in New Jersey, and I got a group called Serenaders, and I want to be with Motown. And I want an audition. She said, can you be here Thursday at 9 o'clock? <laughs> I think we were there at 8.30 or 8 o'clock. So, so that's how we went there. And, we I mean, that whole week, we rehearsed like crazy. You know, I, I'm a stickler for rehearsal. So I, I had my guys laying. So we went there. We auditioned. The, uh, surprising to us, Barry was in town. And Barry heard the, the band and heard us singing. And he was like, you know, he had, he had his back turned to us. And he, in fact, like we didn't even know it was him. He was the guy, just the guy in the room who read the paper. And when we got through saying, he said, how soon can you get, who put this together? And I said, well, I did, and my partner did here. And he said, well, I want you to get, I'm going to fly you guys to Detroit. We're going to sign papers. Uh, we're going to cut this these records. And uh, when you come back, I want you to help run this New York office because <laughs> you got to write great songs. So that's how that started. Wow. So yeah. what what happened uh, once you uh, – how did – you didn't really get anything released on Motown, right? But you did write some stuff while you were there. For what, what now? I said you didn't really release anything on your own through Motown, but you – you did some writing while well, you were there, right? Yeah, well, we had, like I said, the Serenaders had, we had four or five songs that we had already written and we recorded for another label and nothing happened. So we recorded those songs for Motown. In fact, Barry took us in the studio, he and his wife, and they recorded the, the Serenaders, which, which our record was called, If Your Heart Says Yes, was one of my first attempts to write a song that sounded like the Four Seasons. So the, uh, the record came out on the VIP label. Now, the VIP label, a lot of people don't know, but uh, very, uh, very particularly formed that label so that the, they could release the records that we were doing in New York on. 
And because he wanted to put it on Tamler or Motown, it was like he wanted to build a, a sort of a separate operation. So uh, I didn't, and I and I wasn't doing anything as a solo act right then. I was because I started writing, and I was, and Barry was teaching us and lecturing us, and, and he told me he said if you want to make money or be immortal in this business, you got to write songs and not worry about being a singer. So that's what my buddy and I concentrated on. And uh, he ended up being a, a, a fantastic producer after all this, you know. Uh, my buddy was, my partner was George Kerr, and he did Hypnotize, Linda Jones, and, and a few other things. Great guy. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I didn't do any solo recording then. I don't know why. I just was, I was just so wrapped up in being being a, a, a writer, and other people were starting to record our songs. We had our own demo singers. We must have written over a hundred songs for Joe Bet. So we were all, and we were always in the studio cutting them. And that's when we got George Clinton in, because they, Barry said, "I want you to bring new talent in." So one of one of the acts was George Clinton in Parliament. We knew them from you know New Jersey because all the New Jersey groups and all knew each other. So uh, that's how that's how that went. went. So. Uh, what? When did you first meet George Clinton, and what was your impression of him? Uh, um, that's an interesting. That's a very, very interesting question because George and I have this thing going on where we are just kindred spirits. We're like the same kind of. But we're the same person. When I, I'm, I met George so long ago, I don't even hardly remember. But I knew I was sitting in the in a barber shop. I think George Kirk took me over there, and it's, it was soon, it was soon after we formed the Serenaders, and uh, he introduced me to, to Clinton. And I'm sitting over there, and I'm, I'm listening to the guys in the barber shop. They're singing. Uh, George cutting hair, and I realized that this guy is different. You know, now I'm like 16, and he's like. 16. But I'm going, this guy's fucking different, man. He didn't like everybody else. His songs were great. His personality was great. I felt his spirit, you know. Uh, I didn't know at the time we were both the same age, although he's like uh, a few years younger than me. Uh, but anyway, we hit it off. We hit it off great. And uh, so when we, when we get, you know, brought him over to Motown, he and I, Start working together more than New Jersey Kerr and I start working together. So we we got this tight bond, and uh, I mean, how could you not? If you had any kind of musically or, or creative instinct at all, you knew even at that time that George Clinton was different. You know, it good and different, and uh, you know. So I, I was determined to work with him, and he told me later he was determined to work with me too. And I found that was true because when he first, when he got his, one of his, uh, deals to be a staff producer in Detroit for Golden World Records, he called me and flew me out there and we started a, uh, a production company with Mike Terry from the Funk Brothers and that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, were, were you guys frustrated? Were you guys frustrated at all that you didn't get like, you know, a big hit out of, out of that situation or were you just, Glad to be in No, 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 no. We knew, we knew this was a life thing. We were in it for life. And we know life is like life. You don't start off getting somewhere, getting from one room to the other when you're first created or come into this world. You don't just start running into the next room. You gotta figure out how to get into the next room. And you, then you gotta have somebody carry into the next room and then you gotta worry about how you gonna crawl into the next room and then you then you walk into the next room and you run in but first you gotta crawl into the next room and we were like in still in the hallway you know we had we weren't getting to the bedroom yet we were in the living room trying to get to the bedroom and and we knew we had to go through the dining room and then the hallway and da, da, da. so as long as we were in the business we knew, we could see the other guys and what they were doing. So we knew it was, not only was it dangerous for us to get started at that time, it, we would have probably ruined us. 
you know, uh, I had a, I had a break with little Anthony Perry. We had a, he, uh, took us to end, he had some people take us to end records in New York from, from DC, uh, before we moved to New York. And I realized on that first trip to New York, that this was something that could could definitely be my destruction if I didn't handle it right. Because there we were at Ian Records singing in front of George Goldner, who was one of the biggest gangsters in town. Uh, and I'm hearing the other groups, the other groups that had made it, like little Anthony's talking to me, and they ain't making no money. You know, they're getting a lot of other girls and they're getting on stage, but they ain't making, and I thought this was, you had to make money, and it, you know, so I knew the drifters, you know, and they drift, they ain't making no money. So I'm saying, okay, it ain't about having a hit record and making the money because there's too much involved with that. You just try to get, with each opportunity and each record you get, you just get better. And eventually, you're gonna get really good Oh, like I said, somebody's gonna have to take you. You better quit because you just say you had it, yeah. So we we were just glad that we were in it. We were learning. We were people were, were recording our songs. Hey, fuck, Barry Gordy signed us, you know. Um, so uh, why could we could go back? You know, went no way to go before it. So we weren't in a hurry to get a big hit. Of course, you know, you wanted the hits. But like George and I used to talk about it. Well, I have a hit if you don't know what you're doing. You know, it's like having a brand new car and you don't know how to drive. You know, so, you know, just learn, get, just be in it and be happy. You know, that's why I used to tell everybody at work. Just be freaking happy here because uh, stardom will kill you. Hit, I hit record I will, I will waste your life, you know, if, you, if you're not ready for it. Were you, were you mostly trying to replicate, you know, like a Temptations or a Four Tops or a Miracles? Oh, yeah. Or, oh, or, oh, yeah, that was. Or were you trying to do something different? No, well, at that time, we didn't know what different was. You just did what you heard. You know, we to get good at singing harmony, we had to listen. We had to listen to what the flamingos were doing and then sang their songs. You know, we had to listen to what Smokey was doing and sang his songs because those those they were, those were the guys that the people that were making it. You know, so you had to do what they were doing. Now, if you did it. And you did it differently. Yeah, if you were so different that you couldn't do it exactly like they did, you did it your way, and your way was unique enough for everybody to go, "Hey, you know, you're different." Because you, you, you. It's hard to tell when you're different. The other people got to tell you, yeah, yeah. You know. And uh, of course, uh, George was always different, you know. And but if you're different, good, you know. Enough people are going to say. Yeah, well, come on, do this over here, or we'll help you do this, or, you know, we'll help you out, whatever. But, uh, you just try to emulate the guy, the people that are doing it and doing it successful, hoping that you can develop your own way of doing something else, other than what they're doing. How would you describe Barry Gordy? What were, what were his, you know, <laughs> personality traits or characteristics or what kind of person did he come off as back then? Uh, a lot, I don't know, a lot, a lot, oh man, through the years I've talked to a lot of people who have a lot, of, even people that work with me have a lot of different uh, opinions of him, negative and positive. I like the guy, I mean, he was, uh, he was, he was one of a kind he was uh, unique as he could be. I mean, there were no other black guys running record labels, uh, and his personality was great. I liked him because he was like I saw an older me. In other words, I liked this. I liked being with new talent and helping them develop and helping them as well as myself get some kind of outlet. Always active, always writing songs, and that's where he was. And he, he had a little trait about when he's sitting in the studio listening to songs. He had, he's put his tongue inside of his cheek and he rolled it around. And, uh, I realized that, you know, how different he was because nobody else did. Everybody had their own little way. But Barry had a different way of, of, you know, concentrating on the song when he heard it. He wasn't always right about a song. He wasn't always wrong about it. But his, his, his dedication 
you know, and he always went, he, sometimes he went, uh, went into doing things wrong, you know, uh, sometimes he rubbed you the wrong way. I mean, he was a human, very talented man, under a hell of a lot of pressure, and he was from the street. So I understood that, and I, I, I understood it, and I wanted to be a part of it. And he liked me, and I liked him, so that was that was all it took. With all those incredible stars and talent that Motown had at that time, are there one or two that just really popped out to you as just being beyond belief in their talent? Uh... No, they were all so good at what they did. I think now that looking back at it, what it was, it was the producers. It, it was it was it, it was a, a a conglomerate of things that came together to make certain acts that would normally have been just anybody else. Different because the kind of studio in the basement sound, the producers were where their heads, Holland Dozier, where their heads were at, uh, the musicians, the way they play, everything came together to make Mary Well sound more different than everybody else, although she actually wasn't. Uh, the Temptations made them sound different. Although they actually weren't, wasn't, where they weren't. Uh, the Smokey was a little different because he had that little high whiny voice. But he copied from somebody else, so it was a lot of everybody else in him. So, but it was just a conglomerate of things and the, of the elements that came together to make that particular sound. You know, it's like, it's like the Funk Brothers. They weren't just a band. They were trained jazz musicians. And the way they played, in the circumstances of the way the studio was constructed, made everything sound better than a lot of other things. A lot of people would hear it and say, "Oh, that sounds like shit." Stay at the beginning, but then when you put it, when you mix it and put it on the radio, you went, "God damn, this is this is some tough shit." You know. So no, nobody stuck. Everybody stuck out because every time we heard. A new Motown record, it was, it was a badass, better, more than anything we heard because it was a slightly different sound, personality, production, uh, of attitude, and that whole thing. So that was, and it was like a magical thing. Certain things I realized in music are magical, they were meant to happen by the elements. Elvis. Elvis, Elvis was, to, in my opinion, was meant to happen. He had to happen because uh, before Elvis, the civilization was a little different. You know, we looked at each other different. We talked to each other different. We dressed uh, different. Our uh, attitudes were different. Uh, there was a big separation uh, of, of civilizations, of attitudes. Elvis... That was but all that shit together. You know, rock and roll came in and, well, he didn't know. You know, I started, I was a big fan of Elvis. In fact, he was one of the reasons why I, I developed such a drive. Because I said, here's a little country boy. All he wanted to do was sing and look at him. He's changing the world. So I realized, you know, uh, some of us, a more unique, I'm, and I'm, and at times I was wondering, well, why aren't I successful, successful as him? Well, a lot of elements come into the, and, and I had to realize that, you know, that he was a white guy, number one, so he had more opportunity, but he was destined to destroy himself for the better of the, of the civilization. It's like Michael, uh, the Beatles, yeah, all the acts, all the musical acts, Beethoven, whoever you name that created music that, that changed civilization, they destroyed themselves. They imploded from it within, down to Marvin Gaye's. You know, those guys that contributed so much to make us better people and, and whatever. You know, your earth wind and fires, you know, uh, uh, Maurice White ends up, you know, 
dying a horrible death. Uh, it wasn't horrible, but I mean, it was, wasn't shut it was uncomfortable. But, but, you know, after you contribute so much um, of yourself and give so much of yourself and affect so many other people, like I said, stardom is, some, is a very destructive thing. And uh, some of it, if it's big enough, like Elvis and the Beatles, it's meant to be. It had to happen because it it set people in a direction that they had to go in. Yeah, you know, at that particular time, and it saved a lot of it saved uh, of the world from a lot of bad things happening. You know, because it made people go, "Wow, wow, let's just relax, and chill, and dance." You know. Well, you know, it's interesting to think about that for sure. One of my favorites of all time, a couple of years ago, Prince uh, fits right into that too. Definitely. Um, Definitely. It's just, it's just that, you know, when you got name guys like Prince, even, even a Michael, and, you know, yeah, those guys are smaller than an Elvis and a Beatles and a James Brown. You know, because the, I'm talking about the guys that were the first people to do it. You know, the first people to do it, uh, they, I, I wouldn't want to be one of those guys, you know, because, you know, that, that was the Elvis and shit. You know, the, you, you get stardom and then stardom gets you. You know, and, uh, you don't have time to realize what the fuck's going on. You know, I saw it happen to a bunch of friends of mine. You know, Marvin was one of my, nobody knew Marvin had that many demons in him, but his music was so great, and, and his sound was so good, until at one point I'm saying to myself, Marvin's got more going on in him than I thought, because only, only the, the, only the, the hurt and pain can make you sound that good. You know, and at the end, the, yeah, it comes through, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's, you know, the, the, you look at the life of a big star, a celebrity afterwards, you go, damn, you know, I, sh- I love, they were, they, they sure suffered a lot. I'm just glad I enjoyed, had the chance to enjoy their music because they probably didn't. You know, because they got to end up fighting over royalties. They got to end up wondering if they're doing it right. They got to end up, uh, no privacy, you know, too much money. I mean, if you grow, if you brought up in an, in the, in the hood and all of a sudden you got hit records and everybody, all the girls want to give you some loving and the guys want to give you a deal, uh, uh, you, you don't know how to handle that after a while. I experienced a little bit of just enough of that to say, nope, that's not what I want. It's you know. Devil's playground for real. Oh, for real, man. Like, but we need those people. And like you mentioned, Prince. Yeah, Prince, Prince was a byproduct of many others. So the, the, it's the many others that I'm speaking of now, you know, because there are a lot of byproducts, you know. There's a lot of the princes and, and the Michaels and things, you know. They they help make themselves. The Elvises and the Beatles, they didn't have nothing to do with what happened to them. They were all of a sudden they looked around and and they were kings, you know. So that's not good. That's not healthy, you know. It's getting back to um the peak of Motown in the mid sixties there, I you know, I think with George Clinton what he saw there was definitely an influence to him later on when he started making Parliament Funkadelic a hit and building that whole thing he built with, you know, the brides and Parlette and all that. I think he was trying to sort of replicate what you guys had seen in Motown, right? Well, yeah, well, he, it was just a continuation of what he was doing in the barbershop. You know, he was doing what the Temptations were doing in Motown, and uh, he had he was like running a little company, and he was training guys and writing the songs, and uh, so it was a continuation. No matter what towns he was, a Philadelphia or New York or New Orleans, or, well, there were always sets of guys and people, people that were doing things that were doo wopping and making music and, and playing in the studios, and uh, they were always following the guys ahead of them that were making inroads. But as George was like everybody else, you know, he was just, he just at one point said, I'm not going to do it like that anymore. You know, and one of the reasons why he decided to change was, I have to say it humbly, was me, in a way. 
which I'm very extremely proud of, and it opened up my eyes because he talked to me one time, and he told me that, and he also made me realize some of the other people that I had, it, you know, it helped that were different that I had given encouragement to, to go their own way, you know. So when George saw what I did after we after we broke up our little partnership in Detroit uh, in '66, he saw what I did, and he said, "I want to do that." And when Maurice White saw me doing it, he said, "I want to do that." So, what does that put me in the scheme of things? You know what I mean? Does that mean I'm just a little guy that encourages a few guys, or, or am I a guy that really started some shit myself and that didn't realize it till yet? Because, like I said, I'm in my book that's entitled Standing on Solid Ground, and in talking to people about who I was, I realized that my involvement in these certain people's lives Encourage them to do things that change thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives. So I humbly accept that. You know, being a Motown alumni, which I am proud of now to be, you know. And, uh, so yeah, George was, he, he wasn't emulating. We all emulated. Like I said, when I started, I was singing like the Fiestas and, and the Flamingos and, and when George got, you know, he was doing the same thing. And, and the Temptations, when they were coming up, they were doing the same thing. So as they, as they got their break, like George and I had groups, and George had a group called the Parliaments, and they wanted to, to break, but they didn't want to sound or look like the Temptations anymore, which was cool. And But everybody was telling them, you can't do that. And then... I did it, and a couple of more people did it, and George said, I'm going to do it too. And that's what happened. That's why he, he, that's when he went off the rails. Were, were you still in touch with him when he got his first hit with I Want to Testify? We have, we, we have, we have always been, it's just that George and I are connected at the hip, or brain or something. We always stay in touch. There's not a year goes by that we don't know where the other one is or what they're doing or you know, I'll go to his house and spend time. Uh, I was we just went to Florida and the wife and I went to Florida a couple of years ago and I stayed there a while and I was in the studio with him and go live staying at his house, I was hanging out. You know, I mean we're like brothers. You know, George is the only guy that I have in this world that I can call my brother. I don't have any other good really good friends, you know. It's just George. So I, I talked to him. I talked to him for yesterday. You know, it's just always good to hear his voice. He's always glad to see me. Always glad to see him. And we're always encouraging each other. And you wrote uh, "I Bet You," which uh, was a great song that was done by the Jacksons and Funkadelic. And um, that's well, yeah, well, George, yeah, George and I worked for uh, we let George, George, Oh, it was a long story after Motown. Several years went by, and a lot of lot of things happened with both our careers. But we always stayed in touch. So he moved to Detroit and got hooked up with the um, Golden World Records. And then he called me and said, "Come on out and uh, do this production company thing with me and my and him and Mike Terry." And we had the company was called Josie Mike, jo- well, George Clinton, Sidney Barnes, and Mike Terry. So. Our house, our rhythm section in the studio was the Funk Brothers, you know. And, uh, so we, we, uh, we were staff writers for, and producers for Golden World. And, uh, Ed Wingate, who owned the label, had us write, uh, to this girl called, uh, Teresa, Teresa Lindsay that he just signed. And so, uh, we sat down with Teresa one day, and uh, we wrote, uh, I bet you. And it's all really good songs. Teresa recorded it. Uh, five or six other people recorded it. Uh, George recorded it on Parliament. And Jackson Five recorded it, uh, on their ABC album. And they co- recorded it exactly like Funkadelic recorded it on their album, which is a lot of people don't talk about. But it's funny as hell that the Jackson Five as little kids would record a song that the Funkadelic recorded. It, it, you know, years before. 
just goes to show you how, how you know, what people thought of, of George, you know, Puckadilly. Although they probably didn't, I don't know whether they knew George then, but they got to know him. But anyway, that was, what, that was the biggest thing we did. We cut a lot of the stuff, though. 